Good morning, I'm Pastor Gillespie from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church and School, Sherman Center, Random Lake, Wisconsin. It's good to have you with us this morning for the Congregation of Prayer, a guide for daily meditation and prayer around God's Word. It is Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, and it is indeed a good morning. That was a piece from Concordia Publishing House, soon to be released, part of their uh, spring releases uh, for this year that I recorded back in the uh, middle of February and uh, should be available here uh, probably by the end of the month. Uh, let's see. Uh, apologies for yesterday. The end of our uh, Congregation of Prayer um, broke up. I was having audio issues. I rolled back a piece of software that had been updated. I had delayed updating it for a week. Uh, give a chance for any bugs to work out. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there remained bugs, apparently, so <laughs> I was able to go and roll back to a previous version. So hopefully that will uh, solve our problems for now. All right. Good. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, we pray our psalm for the week, Psalm 33. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, he puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing, he frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, to whom are the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him and because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Good. Um, actually, I think today would be a good day to hear a meditation on the Psalms. Let's do that. And that will set the, the tone for our praying at the rest of this week. The psalm begins exactly where the last verse of the previous psalm left off, with a summons to the righteous to sing with joy the praises of God. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. For praise for the, from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. 
The present psalm may thus be read as a sort of continuation of the previous psalm. Even though they are distinct and individual poems, the sense of continuity between them is so pronounced that in some manuscripts they form a literary unit, which would explain why in the Hebrew text this psalm has no title. Whatever it may be said from a literary perspective, however, the two psalms are certainly joined from a theological viewpoint. Proper, the proper praise of God has to do with the forgiveness of our sins and the renewal of our life by divine grace. That's a really profound point. The proper praise of God has to do with the forgiveness of our sins and the renewal of our life by divine grace. Now then, for the first time, the book of Psalms uses an important expression, new song, Shir Kadash, or Kadesh, which will later appear four more times in the Psalter and once in Isaiah. Sing to him a new song, Psalm 95, 97, 143, 149, Isaiah 42. The praise of the righteous, of the just man, to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose mouth is no deceit, is characterized by the particular kind of newness, of renewal, of a new life, inasmuch as he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new, Revelation 21.5. The song of the believers is always a new song because it springs from an inner divine font. It is the song of those who are born again in Christ and therefore walk in newness of life. Romans 6 verse 4, baptism language. The song of the Lord's uh, redeemed is a new song, for they adhere to the new covenant in Christ's blood and serve in the newness of spirit. Romans 7 verse 6. All Christian praise of God is a participation in the liturgy of heaven, where the saints gather in glory about the Lamb in the presence of the throne. According to Revelation 5 verse 9, our new song has to do with the opening of the seals of the great scroll by the Lamb who gave his life for our redemption. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. The new song is for those who have been made kings and priests to our God. Revelation 5.10 The new song is the song of the Lamb. Revelation 15.3 The new song according to Revelation 14one 1-3 is sung by the redeemed as they gather about the Lamb on Mount Zion. This is the folk of whom our psalm says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage, inheritance. Excuse me. All right, so this is not some kind of nationalistic psalm um, of either Israel or of America or some nonsense like that. No, this is of God's people, redeemed by faith. Therefore, when the present psalm summons us to the new praise of God, it is to a newness that will never grow old. Indeed, it will ever or grow ever newer as day by day we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. And our youth is renewed like the eagles. Psalm 102 verse 5. The call to God's praise in Psalm 32 looks explicitly to the absolute fidelity of his word and work. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. How mighty is God's word? By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. Throughout this psalm, there is a sustained contrast between the reliability of the Lord and the unreliability of everything purely human. Quote, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. In contrast, quote, the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart, to all generations. This counsel of the Lord, these plans of his heart, are the contents of that great and mysterious scroll opened by the Lamb who was slain. This is, quote, the mystery of Christ, Ephesians 3, verse 4. The mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, 1, verse 9. By divine grace we redeemed share in the fellowship of his mystery. Ephesians 3 verse 9. Thus there is also a contrast between two kinds of hope, a deceptive confidence, shaker, in a man, or a lasting trust, a call in God. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope, shaker, for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. In contrast, or by way of contrast, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope, la maya kilim, in his mercy. Our soul waits for, our, for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. 
for our hearts shall rejoice in him because we trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, or steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope, yet call new in you. All right. Oh, so one of uh, YouTube doesn't like our stream today. Well, that is no good. Um, all right, let's see if I can just restart it quick. Hold on a second. All right, there we're back now. Okay, so there's our psalm, Psalm 33. Our verse for this week, we say together, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. All right, and then our table of duties for the week. Uh, of civil government, this is all from Romans 13. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. He does not, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Okay. Our first reading today is from Acts chapter 10. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So um, what you find in the preaching of the Acts of the Apostles, I've mentioned to the, this to you before, but here's a great example of it, um, you know, is from whatever scripture is set before them, they always come around to the same message, which is um, that Christ was crucified for the forgiveness of sins, and that forgiveness is for you um, to receive in, the, in his resurrection, right, and in the giving of his word. So... Um, but the reason why this is appointed for this day is particular, um, looking at verse 40. Him God raised up the th- on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. All right, so this is Peter. Um, and so we meet Cleopas and the other uh, uh, disciple on the road to Emmaus, who will also have Jesus revealed to them in the the preaching of his word, and in the breaking of the bread. Which, of course, is important for us because how does Jesus um, reveal himself to us? In the preaching of his word, in the absolution of our sins, in the breaking of the bread, and in the prayers, of course. All right. So the road to Emmaus, we heard this um, last week evening for, yes, for our midweek service. We Heard it read in our daily prayer last week, I think Monday. Um, today we'll do some catechesis on it. 
All right, so you're going to be quite familiar with it now. <laughs> now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they, they uh, talked to each other, or talked together of the, all these things which had happened. So it was that while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know, to, know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one of those uh, one of uh, the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, "Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the uh, things, the things um, which happened there in these days?" And he said to them, "What things?" So they said to him, "The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how." The chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But uh, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is now the third day since these things began. The third day since these things happened. Excuse me. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find the body, they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them, in all the scriptures, the things concerning themselves. And concerning himself, I should say. All right. So, uh, hmm, let's see. What? Well, what day is it? I guess you'd have to look back at the beginning of chapter 24. This is Easter evening, of course. Or afternoon, I guess. Early, early evening. Um, how many disciples were on the road? Two, and they're going to Emmaus, all right, which is, it says about seven miles away from Jerusalem, so probably a little over a couple hour walk, right? Um, what were they talking about? Everything that had happened. Um, this should sound familiar to us. Disciples walking on a road, leaving Jerusalem after a feast of Passover. Now go back to the beginning of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 2, and the 12-year-old Jesus at the temple, uniquely recorded there. All right, after the feast of Passover. Um, And remember that had also to do with that conversion, uh, conversation, that that holy conversation, uh, asking and answering questions, remember? Um, But there it was happening in the temple, now it's happening on the road. So we have a a change of venue as far as where the temple or the dwelling place of God is with man. Of course, it's in the person Jesus. Not really a change of venue at all. All right. Um, Notice who joins them along on the road as they're having their conversation. Jesus himself, but uh, they don't recognize him. They're kept from recognizing him, which is interesting, right? I I think this reveals to us that Jesus uh, wants us to find him um, where he's promised to be and not to look for him where he has not promised to be. All right. So the disciples um, react in thinking that he is just another visitor or stranger in Jerusalem, or to Jerusalem. All right. Um, So we ask them what things, right? This basic uh, rabbinic or catechetical method here. And he knows the answer, certainly, (laughs) but he wants to hear it from them. All right. This aggravates the children, especially when I know they know the answer but then they just kind of play dumb. I'm like, no, I no, I'd like to hear you say it, right? So I can be confident that you have heard. All right, so um, they recount the events. Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and the people, delivered by the chief priests and rulers to be crucified, condemned and crucified. Right? So there's the events. And then verse 21 is very important. 
They say, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Um, they do not, I think, mean to buy back from sin, death, and hell, uh, which is what, what certainly redemption uh, means, but rather um, as an earthly king that would redeem them from uh, kind of those types of sin, death, and devil, which would be um, oppression by uh, the Roman authorities and the chief priests and scribes or something. That he'd be a zealot, right? Um, and then verse 23, uh, the women went to the tomb and they found a vision of angels. Two men, by the way, back in Luke 24, who said he was alive. Uh, two men referred to as angels here. Earlier, there were just two men. And now we have two men on the road. So there's a contrast. Two men that provide the good news message. Two men who have seen everything that has happened and yet do not see the good news. You see the contrast even in, in within the chapter? All right. So why didn't the disciples believe that Jesus was risen, according to verse 24? Him they did not see. Him they did not see. They could not believe for joy. They did not see him, right? And he's going to um, capitulate to them, right? He's going to actually give them to see and to touch him. Uh, that was the sermon on Sunday. Okay. Then, <laughs> how does Jesus address them? Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. All right. Um, ought not you have known that the Christ would suffer these things and enter into glory? And so then um, they ought to have known, but they have not known. How are they going to know unless they have a preacher, right? That's, that's Paul's assertion. How can you believe unless you hear? And how can you hear unless someone preaches? And how is someone going to preach unless they've been sent, right? And so here's Jesus coming and doing that work, expounding to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We call this today, um, not conversation. You could call it a holy conversation. I like that. It's rather than Bible study, it's such a, I mean, it's, it's a descriptive word. It's a descriptive phrase, Bible study. This is what we do. Uh, but I think you should view it differently. It's, it's a holy conversation or it's a catechesis. It's echoing God asking us questions and we answer, or he, um, he ta- he, um, we ask questions and he answers, right? Catechesis. And that's what he's doing here, cate- catechizing the disciples, all right? Uh, and again, this is part of our mandate as, as a Christian church, um, is that we both um, teach everything that Jesus has, has commanded or has, has given us to, to treasure, um, and also that we be hearers and that we receive teaching. Uh, it's probably one of the most frustrating things as a pastor um, over the last probably, not just my generation, but the last couple of generations, is how um, neglectful Christians are to teaching which is, which is a different vocation than preaching. And I know I've made this assertion for you repeatedly. Uh, you are here to receive teaching, so um, this is preaching to the choir, so to speak. But um, uh, proclaiming God's word for the forgiveness of sins is not the same as expositing it or um, I'm doing a, an in-depth study of uh, the grammar and the rhetoric and the logic of, of God's word. All right, um, so uh, that could be done in the context of preaching, of course, then uh, um, the services would be extended in length. <laughs> Maybe we can do that someday, you know, have two-hour services instead of hour and 15 and just uh, put Bible study in the middle. See how well that would go over, right? Hmm. All right. But uh, teaching is essential um, part without hearing God's word and having it taught to you. Um, um, it's very actually it makes it much more difficult to preach to you because I can't just refer to um, Absalom without actually doing a great deal of explanation of who Absalom is because so many um, have neglected uh, to learn God's word in that way that they they know the basic details and the stories and so that they can be used in a proclamatory way. All right, so uh, thank you for being here because this I think will benefit you um, both in your knowledge and understanding of God's word for faith, but also uh, um, to be able to hear preaching and to hear it well. Okay, So um, this is the teaching moment right here, so to speak. And the disciples knew all the details of the last three days, but they did not understand what had happened. They needed to be catechized by Jesus. That is, they needed the scriptures explained to them. It is the same for all of us. 
The word of God needs to be preached and taught among us so that the faith so that faith might cling to the truth of Christ. It is not the seeing which brought faith, but the hearing of the word of God, which would be the key to their faith. All the scriptures testify of Jesus. Jesus made it clear that the entire Old Testament is about him. All right, there's a question. Uh, were there sermons before Luther? Yes, Luther talks about them and says that they're terrible because <laughs> they they do not uh, they would not teach according to God's word. Um, there's uh, some of these things are extant. You can actually read them. Um, the preaching helps that were available um, to the church before, um, really, which you could say the Reformation was a Reformation of preaching. Um, well, really, of the whole divine service, but especially of preaching. So yes, there are books that explain. Um, it's basically it's like Joel Osteen style preaching. It's practical life lessons, how to get rich, happy, and and to, to and to do well in this world. Yeah, so they're pretty terrible sermons. Um, by the way, there's no such thing as Bible study as a separate um, discipline. I mean, there was study in the university, of course. There were classes or courses. Luther would lecture on books of the Bible, but or on doctrine, but um, um, but as far as teaching God's word, that would happen in the context of the sermon as well. And so a typical sermon would be at least an hour, maybe longer. All right. Um, so that's where the, the practical and the, the proclamatory would be put together along with um, just exposition, just teaching what the word says. So a very different time. And uh, I just don't know, you know, most people consider the whole service, if it's over an hour to to be too long and that was a typical length of just the preaching um, for them so um, context changes and varies and uh, it's no one way or uh, you know no command to do it one way or another we can look at the acts of the apostles we can see there are times occasions where they where they would preach all night right into the morning so in any case Yeah, I don't know if they preached in Latin or if uh, they would preach in the, um, I'm assuming since they didn't know Latin, most of the parish priests didn't even know Latin. They only knew it by heart. They didn't actually know what they were saying, uh, that they would preach in the um, in the vernacular, in the language of the people. Okay, uh, let's see. Yesterday we sang the first couple stanzas. Let's sing uh, three and four today, if we could. pray. 
Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may be, by your grace, confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, give us civil authorities who will serve with integrity and faithfulness for the maintenance of justice, the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of all those who do well. Grant all Christians faith in your gracious providence so that we might honor the civil authorities and contribute to the common welfare of our nation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray this day for deliverance against temptation and evil, for the addicted and despairing, for the tortured and oppressed, and for those struggling with sin. We pray for, um, let's see, well, the households of our church, especially Wayne and Mary, uh, my family, the family of Tara and of Lindsay, of Pauline, and of Alan. Pray for our catechumens. We pray for those ill, receiving treatment or recovering, especially Ralph, Allison, Maria, Joe, Dennis, Brad and Billy, Joe, Harriet, Ron, Carol, Mike, Doug, Ruth, Renata, Joan, Sandy, BJ, President Willie, and Phil. Pray for our homebound, Dan, Lenore, Joan, Paul, Dolores, and Pauline. Pray for the missions and mercy work of the church, especially that of Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Uh, Let's see, we continue to pray for those Well, actually, we pray for those who will receive their first calls this month uh, from Concordia Seminary St. Louis and Concordia Theological Seminary Fort Wayne. We pray for those grieving, especially the family and friends of Merlin and of Richard. For all this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. All right. There's our congregation of prayer for today, Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. It's good to have you with us here. Um, Hope it was a blessing to you. Tomorrow we'll have Jesus finally reveal himself to those two um, on the road in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers. All right? So uh, God be with you all. See you in the morning. We thank you for listening to this podcast from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church Sermon Center in Random Lake, Wisconsin. If this podcast is of benefit to you, please consider supporting the work of St. John by visiting stjohnrandomlake.org, that's stjohnrandomlake.org, slash support, and give today.